Good evening, everybody. Good evening to the ESGE Academic Skill Webinar, Getting Your Endoscopic Research uh, Published. So the question is, of course, uh, by the way, my name is Peter Siersema. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a gastroenterologist at the uh, Rothbard University Medical Center, and also I am the editor-in-chief of Endoscopy. Um, I think the, the important question is why this webinar? Well, the, the, the reason is that I re have received over the years and also still receiving questions about how to perform research. And the questions that I receive are, for example, how to choose an exciting research topic that will be of interest to a journal, but also how do I start writing a paper and what are the do's and the don'ts uh, for writing a paper? And to discuss this topic, we have two um, uh, excellent speakers for, uh, tonight invited. Uh, the first speaker is Michael Bretthauer. He is from the University of Oslo, but also the associate editor of Annals of Internal Medicine. And the second speaker is Heiko Paul from Dartmouth Kaiser School of Medicine in the US. And he is the, uh, the present co-editor in chief of endoscopy. Um, the ESE webinars uh, are now uh, well known to everybody. It's already the fifth year that uh, ESE offers this. And what's important for you tonight? Well, we have a Q&A box. So if you have any questions, please uh, send them uh, through the Q&A box. We will try to discuss them during, this, during the webinar. And if not, we will try to answer them in the Q&A box. The other thing is, is also important, uh, and that is about the CME credits. And this, and this evening, uh, you will see an, uh, an email with a link to complete the survey in order to receive your CME credit certificate, uh, certificate. It's important to know that you have to do this before March 27, um, of we'll close on, on March 27. And uh, it's also important that your attendance is, is monitored and participants not attending the whole session will not be issued with a certificate. So thank you for your understanding. So then we move on to the first speaker, Michael Bretthauer. I introduced him already. And I think the first topic is also something that will be definitely of interest when discussing getting your endoscopy, endoscopic research published, the do's and the don'ts when writing a paper for a journal. Michael. Thank you very much, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here. Good evening from Oslo, Norway. So uh, I agree with you, Peter, we have a very exciting program tonight for all of you out there. Uh, and I will start with a general talk about uh, what to do to increase your chances to get accepted for publication in a good journal. Now, there are some general principles that I would like to start with for this talk, which is, in, which is important for all of you who perform research in endoscopy, but also in other fields. Uh, and I will come back a little later in this talk with, uh, with bullet point number one, which I call new, true, and interesting, which is pretty much uh, the take home message from my talk. And I will explain you a little later what that means. Um, also, um, you have to remember and you have to realize as uh, endoscopic researchers or as researchers in any medical field that you really don't write for yourself. You do write for yourself for your academic rewarding or for your own pleasure, but in reality, you write for the people who read the pieces you write. And that may be your colleagues out there in other endoscopy units, it may be the patients or it may be policymakers or the people that pay for your salary. Uh, and the, the, the things you write should be new, true and interesting because it matters for the people you write for. Because you don't write for yourself in reality, um, it also means that your first paper should be as good one as the last paper you write in your career. And of course, that may be a contradiction in term because obviously you're not experienced uh, uh, at the first paper as much as you are at the second one or third one or the 200th one. But because you write for the readers, you need help in training and supervision to write the best papers you possibly can right from the start of your career. So we as editors and Peter and Heiko and myself are editors and have been editors for quite some time. We sit with a lot of manuscripts that we are considering for publication. And uh, it may help you to understand how to increase your chances to get published uh, by looking at how we work at the journals. 
And this is how we work at Annals of Internal Medicine, which of course is a general medical journal, but which publishes papers in gastroenterology and in endoscopy on a regular basis. And I'm in charge of these manuscripts at the journal. What I will show you is how we work, but this is pretty similar across all the major journals uh, in medicine and also in gastroenterology endoscopy. Now, when your paper comes in, when you submit it, it gets usually uh, submitted to the editor-in-chief who will uh, look at it and have a very quick look at it and then decides if he or she should either just reject it upfront, which usually happens then in a day or two, or send to a pair of editors which we call deputy editors and associate editors is at annals, um, called a little bit differently at the endoscopy journal, for example, but it's the same kind of setup. So deputy editors are people who work full-time for the journal. Associate editors is some, would be somebody like me who is an expert in gastroenterology, endoscopy, and these pair of people would handle your papers further. Now, these two people from the second day after your submission will decide if they either sent the, 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 the piece out for review uh, or reject it upfront. And I will tell you in a minute how we make that decision. Now, if it goes out to review, we usually um, pick uh, uh, a lot of reviewers sometimes, maybe it can be uh, five or 10 or 15 to get at least two reviews for each paper. And we give people two weeks, reviewers two weeks to uh, get back to us with their reviews for the paper. So. The reviews uh, are coming back to us uh, and we are making a decision as a team of the two editors. If we still believe this is an interesting papers, paper and the reviewers uh, have comments that are valuable to us, we are not making the decision only based on reviewer comments. I will come back to that also. Then um, your paper will go to our weekly manuscript conference where there is a, uh, uh, a lot of people present. There are the editor-in-chief, all the deputy editors, and all associate editors from all fields of medicine that will discuss your paper around the table. Uh, this is a big group of people, and most of them uh, need to like your paper to uh, get through that hurdle. And most papers that are coming to this conference are actually rejected there. Now, after that, it goes to a statistical meeting with people who are skilled in statistics, and there it's also discussed. And if it's still for survive, and then you're down to four or five percent of the papers we get submitted, then you will know this is the first letter you will get if you're still there. And this will take six weeks, eight weeks, and then you will know that we are interested. And then multiple rounds of revisions with you, the authors will start until the paper gets accepted. As you can see, there's a lot of areas here where you could look bad and uh, been thrown out of the process. And I now try to explain to you how you can avoid that. So the three major reasons for rejection at, at our journal and many other journals is number one, quality, that the science is flawed. It doesn't have the quality that we require. For example, the study design is not appropriate to answer the question that you want to answer. Or uh, there's a lack of novelty. The science is good, but this is not news. Somebody else has published the same thing last year or two years ago. Or it's just not the right audience. You know, if we get, uh, if we get uh, uh, manuscripts from fields completely different than internal medicine or, or general medicine, then we may say, well, this is a good, maybe a good paper, but not for our journal. So I'm coming back to new, true, and interesting and explain to you what that means for us. And you may already understand it. So new is, uh, does the research that we get submitted extend what we, not, not we as editors, but we as a field of medicine already know? If the answer to that, to that is yes, it's new, then it's interesting. But if it's not, then maybe not. Of note, of course, a novel confirmation. So the second study or the third study may also be of interest if it adds to the previous knowledge. Just a couple of sentences about what we call salami science or the least publishable, publishable unit. We do not like that you break up your, for example, randomized trial into five di different papers and publish the variables uh, broken up into five different pieces. We often say to, to, uh, to uh, authors, we want the whole story. So if you have done one randomized trial, well, then you publish it in one paper.
So what about true? And with that, we mean if it's valid. So is the study design appropriate for the question you would like to address? Are the participants well described and are they the right target group for, for that intervention that you studied? Are the methods and the statistical analysis appropriate and do we understand them? Do the numbers add up? This is a, a very common mistake. Please check your numbers thoroughly. Numbers from table one should match up with the numbers in table two. Uh, otherwise you look sloppy and you don't want to look sloppy in that process. And is your interpretation of what you have been doing appropriate? And finally, is this interesting to anybody who reads the journal? It may, may be clinician, it may be policymakers, or it may be other researchers, but you have to define your audience and you have to align it with the audience or the readers of the journal that you submit to. Coming back to the reviewers, many people believe that the reviewers make the decisions. Uh, that's not true. It's the editors, it's us who make the decisions. We use the reviewers' comments for guidance, but very rarely we are basing our decisions on the reviewer comments alone, uh, almost, uh, almost uh, uh, never. So it's guidance, but it's not more than that. Uh, not, so, not so rarely reviewers disagree on what they think about papers, and it's up to us to make decisions. And sometimes uh, we reject uh, papers with only excellent reviews because we have, may have other reasons. We have made uh, identified things that the reviewers didn't pick up. We may have other papers already in our pipeline which address your topic, and, and that makes it less interesting, for example. So do's and don'ts is uh, the topic of this call. Uh, make it easy for us. Uh, we, as editors, we would like to go home just as everybody else. So make it easy. Think about what you write. Uh, think about writing papers that you would enjoy reading as a reader. For example, length. We are not happy if you write us. We would be happy to shorten our manuscript if you desire. It's not our job to tell you that. It's your job to make the manuscript as short and as concise as possible and to adhere to what you tell we tell you. If we say our papers should not be longer than 3,000 words, don't send us a 5,000 words paper because we will reject it. About writing, avoid long paragraphs. Usually one major idea per paragraph. Avoid long and complex sentences, too many commas. Use active voice instead of passive voice. Avoid repetition, avoid abbreviations, be precise and specific. For example, a very large problem. problem. Usually it's enough to say a problem. A massive increase is not scientific language, it's just an increase. Or a highly significant association, it's just a significant association. You're not writing a book about your grandmother, you're writing a scientific paper. And then of course it helps to revise. Multiple drafts are often necessary before publication. Anything between five and 30, sometimes 50 is normal. Include your ex more experienced co-authors and sometimes send it to somebody else outside your group. It helps to get better. One slide about the cover letter. The cover letter is something that all journals ask for. It's your opportunity to write something, a message to the editor, and we usually read your cover letter. Um, it's the opportunity to explain to you, for example, why your paper is important, why this journal is the right audience, or why it is timely right now. If there's other information you would like to convey, such as that there are other papers out there by your group with overlapping content or something else, here, this is the place to do it. Use that opportunity. However, do it short, clear, and concise. Uh, rule of thumb, not longer than one page. Illustrations, and that is uh, figures and tables, important in scientific manuscripts, often overlooked, uh, but here is where you can score points with the editors and with the reviewers. Now, first principle, 
for, for, um, for illustrations, reduce the amount of data. This is the uh, map of the London tube in 1913. A lot of information that is superfluous. Here is the map we are currently using all across the world where a lot of the oh, superfluous, the unimportant information is cut out. All, uh, all the things that you don't need. Do the same thing with your papers. Only display what you need. Principle number two for illustration is a logical order. Don't put it in the order that Excel gives you for some odd reason. Excel does not understand your order of your data. For example, a bar graph may come, may come out like this. Order it, for example, by the height of the bars. It looks much better on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side. It helps the reader and us editors to understand what you have been doing. Be conscious about this. <clears throat> Here, for example, is different cities uh, here in Norway and the populations of these cities. This is uh, ordered by, uh, by the first letter of the city, which does not make sense. It makes sense, but not for your purpose. If you, for example, would like to know which is the largest city, you should order it by the largest city. It's easier for the reader. Do it. Last principle, simple layout. We are happy that you can use all the functions in Excel like here, but we don't need it. It's great that you have done the course, but please, every bit of ink on the graphic requires a reason, as Edward Tufte, uh, uh, a master in illustration, said. About colors and layout, please, uh, please uh, be aware that uh, about 4% about 4% of the male population in the world are color blind. And that color blindness is a red and green blindness. So don't use red and green together in your figures because 4% of us who are males will not be able to see the difference. This is how we work with, uh, with uh, scientific illustrations. This is from a medical student, student who uh, this winter did a study and she gave me this table and I said, well, you have to do it a little better. And we work with her over about three weeks and ask her to make a figure because figures usually are nicer than tables if you can do it, if the data are there. Then we change to error bars, then we change to colors, and then we thought we would like to tease out the difference uh, between the different graphs and we insert what we call an inlet. This is something that you can use to display. And then we would like uh, the, the increases in for the bars on the illustration. So all this you can do, it will take you time and effort, but it's worth it. And at the end of my talk, this is a novel approach, this is a letter that we, re we, re we uh, received from authors recently, and I will read it to you. The editor, thank you for your rejection of our above manuscript. Unfortunately, we cannot accept the rejection at this time. We receive many rejections each year and are unable to accept them all. Indeed, we typically accept fewer than 30% of all rejections we receive. Please, do not take this as a reflection of your editorial work. The standard of some of the rejections we receive are very high. Specific factors that influenced our decision not to accept your rejection included the failure of review number one to recognize the importance of our work. Simply stating this work is not novel nor interesting and does not extend knowledge is no longer sufficient reason for our accepting a rejection from your journal. Together with the use of complicated statistical terms by reviewer number two made it extremely unlikely that we would accept your rejection. We do wish you and your editorial team every success in the future and expect that your rejection that I will find an alternative paper where its message will be better aimed. Please understand that our decision is final. Sincerely, the authors. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. This was a very funny letter and maybe also a letter that, uh, that tells us that we also have to think sometimes about the letters that we write to the, to the authors. Uh, and, and apart from that, you also gave us some very important do's and don'ts uh, that are, are needed uh, and that should be kept in mind when writing a paper. Um, 
And I would like to also, I would like the, the participants that are joining this, this uh, uh, webinar, please send us our, uh, uh, send, send us your questions because we are happy to answer them. And I would like to start with the first question and that is how important it is to bring in a statistician or a methodologist when you're writing a paper, uh, Michael? Well, it is very important. So there are, of course, some people who are very skilled both in uh, um, study design and statistics. If you are you know, one of those few persons, of course, you don't need to bring in somebody else. But usually for all other people, um, like me, for example, it's very important to work with statisticians, maybe with the epidemiologists, with, uh, with experts on study design. Now, you should not do that when you have done the study and when you're about to submit your paper or you write your paper. You have to do it from the first day you plan the study. To bring in a statistician very late after you have done all the experiments, that is very suboptimal. That's absolutely true. And that sometimes people do forget this. And then, of course, uh, this is really a problem. Another other topic that I think is important is also to mention the conflicts of interest that people have. And I think that's also for the annals an important topic. Uh, how, how, is this, how is this handled? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, conflicts of interest is, is of, in, of great interest to us. Uh, now, the main rule here for all of you to remember is to be transparent. Put things up and tell the editor about it. We, um, we don't judge you, uh, but we would like to know. Sometimes we may think or we think that there is a lot of conflicts of interest to publish a paper, but that happens rarely. It's, it's very much about transparency. If you have written a good paper and you have received money from a pharmaceutical company or some entity, uh, tell us. Um, uh, that's how research is, is done uh, very often, and it doesn't disqualify you. So conflicts of interest are potential conflicts of interest that the readers would like to know, but they're not disqualifying. So transparency is the key. If we find out or somebody else finds out that you have an interest that you have not revealed to us, that's a problem, but not the other way around. No, that's true. Uh, you said something very, very interesting to me in the beginning, and that was, uh, and that's also what we, what, what authors sometimes very difficult find to accept, and that is sometimes papers are uh, rejected with excellent reviews, and, uh, and and that always, well, almost always leads to to papers to uh, to letters to the to the editor in chief uh, and and trying trying to ask for an explanation. Um, how how does how does the annals handle this? I mean, how can you uh, how can you how can you make this clear to the authors? Yes. So um, as as you say, and as I said in my talk, um, um, it's not unusual that uh, we reject papers, and I know the same is true for endoscopy, where I, where I worked with you, Peter, and Heiko before. Um, we reject papers with good reviews because we have only so much space and we, re we receive far more papers uh, than we can publish. And some of these papers that we don't publish have good reviews. Now, um, we have a pipeline with things. You don't know our pipeline. We know our pipeline. So as I said, if there's something else we already have accepted and you are coming in as number two or number three, we may not be interested but because we know we in four or six or eight weeks, we are going to publish a paper, which is very similar uh, to yours. And therefore we are at this time, unfortunately for you, not interested in your paper. We will not tell you that, that we have another paper. We will just politely try to tell you that we are not interested. Um, and in the letter that we are sending out from annals, usually in these instances, there is a clear note that our decision is based on our evaluation and that the reviews, although they may seem positive, are not the whole story. But we cannot uh, write more and we won't, don't want to write more than that because number one, there's a lot of confidential information that we cannot reveal to you, which is internal and, re and involves other people, uh, for example, other authors. Number two, um, when we reject a paper, we are not usually interested in going into discussions with the authors and, and have fights about it. Uh, we, you can complain, and we will, we will take every complaint seriously, uh, but we are not eager to have back and forth emails, why did you do what you did? 
So we have an interesting question coming from Spain. Uh, and that question is as follows. Why did, you, why did you become an editor? What is your main motivation to spend time as an editor and reviewer? Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important question, of course. It's a very important question. I can answer it for myself and then Peter and Heiko, you can answer it for, 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 for you. I enjoy science. And I enjoy um, to take part in the dissemination of science. So making science available to other people, to the readers that we talked about, to the general public. Uh, and if I can help with making good science available in a good way to other people, I, I, I enjoy that. That's my main motivation. Heiko, Heiko, would you like to answer this question as well? Why did you become an editor? Yeah, thanks, interesting question. Uh... Uh, I was actually asked to join when Thomas was still the uh, chief editor of Endoscopy. And I really grew to love what I'm doing there. Um, to uh, see the efforts of writing papers, submitting new ideas, and, and particularly helping shape and improve papers that are being submitted. Um, I think that's rewarding. So that's, I haven't thought about this in a, in a long time. Good question. No, but it's, that is an important question. And of course, that's also something that we maybe may ask ourselves every now and then. And, and in, indeed, it is nice to be, uh, uh, to, to take part in the process of improving a paper and, and, and uh, being part of a message that's important to improve the care of our patients, of course. I think that's for me, at least one of the uh, stimulus uh, to do this. Uh, there's another uh, question coming uh, in uh, from Lithuania, uh, presenting a rare clinical case to the extent necessary to introduce a, with global experience or make more attention to how good treatment has been achieved. I'm not sure whether this is an, uh, a question, but more, I think, a comment, and maybe also relating to the question why being an, uh, an editor, as far as I can see. I, I have a, a final question for you, uh, Michael, and then we move on to, uh, to Heiko. There's always the question about retrospective studies and prospective studies. And of course, we are, we are very keen in, in seeing prospective studies at the same time. We also know that it's also, also every now and then important uh, to have a, a large series that could also answer a question. How do you, how do you look into that? Yeah, very good question. Both are interesting. And I think it refers actually to a question that is just coming in. Both are important. Both are valuable, both epidemiologic research, so retrospective cohort studies, case control design, case, case, case control studies, and prospective, for example, randomized trials are uh, important. The key here is, apart from the research question, of course, is the design. There are, there are very well-designed observational studies that have a, a, a large impact of cl on clinical medicine. They're also poor observational studies. And the same is true for the prospective trials. So I think it's not so, it's not so much about the design, but it's about, it's about how well the science is done and how novel it is. I fully agree. Uh, there are some more questions, which I think we will, uh, we will pick them up uh, at the end of, of, this, of this webinar. I first go to the next uh, to the next uh, uh, presentation, and the presentation will be given by uh, Heiko Paul. I in introduced him already before. He's the current um, editor, co-editor in chief of Endoscopy, uh, working currently at Dartmouth uh, uh, in in the US, and he will discuss the question: What types of articles are endoscopic journals interested in? Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to this ESGE series. Uh, pleasure to be part of it. Um, so we talk about which types of articles are journals interested in, and part, uh, Michael has already uh, discussed it or started to talk about this. Um, but I just want to review briefly, if you do research related to endoscopy, uh, you have all kinds of different options to submit. And um, as you may imagine, it depends on the topic that you researched on and it depends on the interest of the journal, uh, whether the topic of a research is covered by the journal. And I just listed, you know, the journals that we kind of most know, endoscopy, GIE, surgical endoscopy, but there's also EIO, digestive endoscopy, clinical endoscopy, 
and this techniques and innovation in gastrointestinal endoscopy in newer journal related to the AGA. And then there are the main GI journals uh, that are not just focused on endoscopy, as you can see here, got gastro, AG, uh, ADG, CGH, and so forth. Um, and it seems like ever more journals are popping up, uh, like Lancet has now for several years, the Lancet and Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and so are others. And then we have the main medical journals but that includes, for instance, the annals. Uh, 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 and, and we heard about the annals of internal medicine a moment ago. So, so what's really the journal's interests? And you heard it's all about new, true, and interesting, right? So the, the triple. Um, so in general, it's about quality, as Michael pointed out, and the topic, uh, and whether the topic is interested, whether the journal is interested in the topic. But it's also for you, what type of study would the journal want? So for you to select the right journal and how can I make the manuscript not change, but fit? So for instance, if you write an introduction for a um, endoscopy journal, the introduction might sound very different than you uh, write an introduction for a paper that you try to submit to Annals of Internal Medicine because the readership is different. So I thought I just, uh, in preparation, I looked at how many papers were published related from endoscopy in our top medical journals. And there were three original papers coming from endoscopy only over the past three, four years in the New England Journal of Medicine. One related to the timing of endoscopy of upper GI bleeding, one surgical myotomy, uh, the randomized trial, uh, surgical versus endoscopic poem myotomy, and then um, randomized trial and medical versus surgical treatment for refractory heartburn. Um, so this gives you a little bit of an idea of um, what they're interested in. Of course, the, the, the major issue or the major quality point is, is the topic, it's novel, randomized trials, large, representative kind of game changers informing our clinical practice. So how about annals? Well, in the last two years, there have been actually five or so endoscopy papers, and you can see the top uh, four of those. Uh, and, and again, there's a non-inferiority randomized trial on hemostatic powder. Um, there is some image-enhanced endoscopy randomized trial. There is actually the study that we got published on recurrence of colorectal neoplasia, which is like a natural history study, not randomized, just kind of a cohort study. And then there is a population-based study uh, on sigmoid oscopy screening trial. So, so what is the journal's interest? And it's interesting that, that Michael, you said the new, the true, and the interesting. And I think it really corresponds to the three points that I uh, highlight, I want to highlight innovation, quality, and clinical relevance. Innovation like new quality is like, is it true? And clinical relevance is interesting, is relevant. So the innovation um, is, does the study in, uh, address a new question, a really new question? And the quality we heard about quality, are the results valid? You Do we believe the results that the paper or the study is presenting? And are the findings representative? or is it just for a very selective group of patients that were enrolled into that study? And then of course, the clinical relevance that I, I seem to have a major, or I, I seem to have really, it has to be clinical relevant, what you publish. It has to be some kind of meaning to it. Now we talk about this in a moment too, to expand a little bit more on that. So I try to understand or try to find examples of what we've published in endoscopy over the past uh, month or two. Um, so that you get an understanding will be published in endoscopy and endoscopy focused journal. So water exchange improves total enteroscopy rate. So here's the question of small bowel endoscopy, right? It's a randomized trial, which you think would be high quality. Water exchange improves total enteroscopy time. Interventions to improve enteroscopy rate uh, are novel. Um, and so innovative quality and it's clinically relevant, right? 
because water exchange is superior to carbon dioxide. So it has some clinical implication, randomized trial done, and seems to be a novel question. So enough reasons to accept that paper. Now here is something like an AI system for distinguishing just from lyomyomas during um, EUS. Now, this is innovative because there was not a known study on this before. The quality is a little bit questionable because it's a limited data set. And there, although it was um, um, prospectively tested, it's still an early and the first study. But is it really clinically relevant if I have an accuracy of about 70% or 80%? Does it mean I will change now my, my approach to any submucosal lesions to only do AI? and for forego uh, the FNA, no, I will still do a needle biopsy or a needle aspiration of that lesion. So, so it's innovative, but it's not yet really clinically relevant and the quality is, is pretty good. So that's the reason to accept it. And then we have an interesting study here that was uh, published as an innovation and brief communication study on transoral incisional phonoplication. So the endoscopic version of doing you know, reflux, uh, uh, reflux uh, treatment after a poem um, to prevent reflux or treat reflux disease. And there was a significant reduction in GERD symptoms. There was a reduction in PPI use, and there was a reduction actually in objective measures, the DEMISTA score. So, but interestingly, there were only 12 patients and it was retrospective. So it's new, but it's really not a high quality study, right? So it's limited. You don't know whether it's reproducible, uh, whether it will hold up. It's probably operator dependent too. So, but the interesting thing here, and I think that's representative, if you have something completely novel, particularly in endoscopy, it seems to have a higher chance of being accepted or published, not just in endoscopy, but other journals too. And I'll give you some more examples. So the most, the, 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 the factor that we all think about amongst the journals is what's the impact factor. In other words, how visible is a paper after it's being published? How often is it being cited? The impact factor is a ratio between how many, um, uh, how many citations you have in a journal on a given time, um, uh, over how many uh, original articles have been published, uh, put simply. Um, so, and I pointed out that maybe novel and new interesting things might be something that uh, um, favor publication. So here is the one uh, from 15 years ago where um, uh, there was a N of one study, somebody scoped himself and put this as a case report. Um, it got nine citations, so it doesn't, didn't really get any scientific visibility, um, but it also got some other visibility, Ig Nobel Prize, which is like um, a, a Nobel Prize um, that is um, awarded to those with unusual uh, and for unusual and trivial achievements in scientific research um, to, that seem to make you think first or laugh first and think later. So, so very innovative, but low quality, low clinical relevance, but still probably not something most journals would, would want to publish because of low citation potential, uh, even though it's kind of innovative. So here's um, the impact factors. Um, you can see, you know, there's a, of course, the medical journals are much higher. Um, the thing is though, the impact factor should not be really something that's guiding in your decision. Um, on the other hand, if you have a high impact factor journal, you're also more likely to attract good quality papers. So there's always a balance between thinking too much about the impact factor and, um, and making sure you get the papers that are really important. Um, one of the, uh, the, the articles that I think um, are disadvantaged are the negative uh, studies. And um, for instance, if you have a high quality study that addresses an important question, but the outcomes are negative, so there is no real clinical impact from the results, it might have less, re less um, uh, potential to being studied um, because it's less clinically relevant and the impact might be lower. 
So as you as you might know, some journals, AGJ has has uh, published a negative study issue, for instance, to address that that uh, uh, problem. Um, I also want to look at what are the papers that got mostly cited in endoscopy, and uh, not only for GI for endoscopy, but also for other journals. Um, in that field like GIE, it's actually the guidelines are the ones that are being mostly cited. But if you don't think about the guidelines, um, here are the top five most cited articles in 2020 over the previous two years. And you can see small bowel endoscopy, capsule endoscopy, POEM, um, uh, pylorum myotomy, radio frequency ablation of neuroendocrine tumors, and some AI on detection of early gastric cancer study. Um, so you can see it's it's really not necessarily that you have a randomized trial that ends up here, but that um, the 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 mostly cited um, most cited uh, papers seem to be uh, papers that uh, deal with new technologies or uh, innovation. Uh, and here are the top six to 10, underwater resection of the duodenal adenoma. Again, a poem study for uh, management of esophageal diverticula uh, and then single operator cholangioscopy. So those are just some examples, which um, there was a chat question about randomized trials that they are increasingly or that they are favored. Um, we actually, over the years, we wanted to have high quality studies in endoscopy and we wanted to, uh, of course, um, um, attract randomized trials, but we were all surprised to see that's not really the randomized trials that are mostly cited, but really the technology driven uh, papers, even innovations and brief communications only. So, and here is just the top five of all times in endoscopy and poem leads. Uh, there's a paper on missed rates for colorectal neoplasia, double balloon enteroscopy, which was the very first study. Again, myotomy, which preceded the poem, um, and then double balloon enteroscopy. So those are kind of game changers at the time or the first publications, and they continue to be referenced, and therefore they end up in the top five. Um, so I think I have a couple more minutes. Um, so this is just a summary uh, of those that you know highly cited guidelines and reviews, but then of course no, new papers, innovations, those with uh, clinical relevance and high quality. Um, Michael has talked about the quality of a paper. I just want to um, uh, share this kind of preparing where this this guide how to prepare a manuscript by Gil Welch, one of my mentors which summarizes uh, also or uh, in part what what Michael was saying about clarity and transparency transparency and um, not you know cutting down to the essential in terms of writing style uh, and I also want to uh, highlight the importance of having a mentor particularly early on and also sending your manuscript that you've written to colleagues even if they don't know exactly specifics about that topic but just give it to them before you send it in. Just ask them for feedback. You know, do they understand what you've written? Is it is it clearly spelled out? Uh, is there some kind of meaning to them reading it uh, and and understanding what you've done? And um, finally, I just want to make a, a strong point about it's really not about the journal. It's about the research that you are doing. So you are pursuing the research, you have to be driven. So it shouldn't be driving you that you want to publish in a certain journal. Uh, the study questions should be driving you. And I think in my experience, there are two main motivations to do research. One is to resist or oppose, the other one is to improve. So for instance, uh, I still have a hard time kind of dealing with the very small polyps. Um, because uh, I have a hard time believing that they really matter. Uh, of course, they are part of the ADR and you have to do something about it, but I have a sense of opposition to it. And out of that sense of opposition, 
uh, I've done several studies um, in part, for instance, related to resect and discard, which would at least minimize uh, our efforts that we take um, on, uh, on small studies. So one is what's really bothering you? Why the hell am I doing this? And then coming up with a research question out of this. And the second one is to improve. You do your clinical procedures and you think, why are we not doing it differently? Why are we not you know, making it a little bit different in this technique or why not trying this way? So those are the improvement ideas. And I think those are the strongest motivators uh, where research questions are being born, born out. And then of course, there are other things you have a truly innovative idea and you want to understand. So just to give you a couple of examples out of my own uh, history. So resist, I talked about resecting discard. Uh, I also resist of throwing things away. So we kind of counted the waste bags, which was just published in gut, how much waste we produce in endoscopy. Uh, then to improve, like shouldn't clip closure help to reduce risk of bleeding after large polyp resection? This is like an idea to improve or the use of a cap. We did a randomized trial on cap assisted colonoscopy. It didn't help, uh, but it, it was driving me because I, I thought we just really have to understand whether it helps or not. Um, and then to understand, for instance, one of the questions I had is, is the intestinal dysplasia growing up beneath the sub, uh, 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 squamous epithelium in the, in the esophagus? So I was really excited about this, trying to understand how much intestinal plays you have up on the esophagus in the Barrett's segment, but it only got 14 citations. Why? While to understand incomplete resection, of course, got many more citations and more visibility. So, but those are things, you know, trying to understand that drive what you're doing. And then there are some new ideas that come out of some question, clinical questions, and you wonder, how can you solve this? And then you have an idea and you may go for it. So this is just from my own experience. Um, and that's the summary of what I just said. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. I'm curious about the questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Heiko, for this uh, exciting talk, I would say. Uh, and especially because I think you uh, highlighted it at the end, an important issue. And that is, you always have to ask yourself questions. Why do I do the things I do? And how can I improve? And how can I take care? Uh, for my patients in a better way, et cetera, et cetera. And I think those are the type of questions that lead to, uh, to good uh, research uh, uh, questions, but also to, uh, to excellent uh, uh, outcomes in, in, in studies that are uh, well designed. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, coming in the, in the, in the uh, Q&A app. And, and I, again, I, I, I welcome everyone to, uh, to send in these uh, Q&As because that's a nice way of, of dealing and discussing some important topics of, of uh, publishing papers in high quality journals. One question is, I think, interesting, and this is also something I also do not uh, very well understand. That it is, some journals ask the author to suggest a reviewer, and I never understand why this is done. Um, Michael, can you help the uh, Elena with this question? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh... I'm not sure if it's a good thing either. Um, so, so some journals ask you for the reviewers that you would like. Other journals also ask you for the reviewers you would dislike. Um, I don't know if it helps you anything to put up either. Uh, what I know some of my colleagues do is if you put up the one you would like and one you would dislike, they would choose both of them. <laughs> uh, so it, it doesn't, doesn't bring you any further. Uh, but some journals just do that, and it's up to you if you put the forward names there or not. It 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 it's not a disadvantage if you just leave it blank. I I would not look at it, and my colleagues uh, neither. So so do it if you like it, and just don't do it if you if you dislike it. I always have the feeling that they do this to fill their uh, uh, that database with uh, reviewers on topics, uh, but maybe that's yeah. maybe maybe that's another reason. Heiko, do you do you have any feelings about this uh, asking for reviewers? I usually don't write anything in there unless I I have a favorable reviewer that I like and who knows the topic. Um, but but uh, I think the journals do it because it's work to find reviewers. And you know, we all know that often you get rejections from reviewer they don't deliver or so. So, so having some help from the authors 
uh, to suggest a review of my help, the editors. So the, the, there's a question coming from uh, Mario Spanos. Uh, even though a prospective randomized trial is the best to have, how would you view a prospective audit, uh, Heiko? Uh, prospective randomized trial is best. Uh, what is a prospective so the, the, audit? So something I have the same like, question. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Like a prospective uh, I think a prospective uh, observation or something like that. I, I think that's the other question I, I wanted to. It's you do the best quality or design that's possible. You cannot always do randomized trial and sometimes you cannot do prospective trial to answer the question you have. And, and and then you do the best out of this. And if if you can do a prospective study to answer the question, you should definitely should this do this. But for instance, if you want to prospectively understand the risk factor for patients who transition to esophageal cancer, um, and you want to do it here in your local area, then you have to probably do a case control study and go backwards. You cannot do a prospective study. Of course, we have no nurse health study and the other prospective large databases. But I think it's you, you can do research even if you don't have the strongest typical designs and, and you want to do the best that you, you it's available to you to answer the research question. And if, if, if you don't have the resources, let's say, there should be a randomized trial, but you only have five patients in your medical center, that's the other point. You probably shouldn't do research like this. You have to uh, use as a research um, objective what's available to you to study. That's true, and, and of course, sometimes it's needed to, uh, well, to uh, to uh, to ask other journal or to ask other hospitals also to join you. So then they will have a multi multi center study, which of course is something which I very much like uh, when these type of studies are being submitted. What about you, uh, Michael? No, I totally agree with, with Heiko's, uh, Heiko's comments. As I said before, it's not too much, so much about study design, it's how you approach things, what research questions you have, how well you have done your study, regardless of you know, if it's an audit, as you, as you call it, uh, in the audience or, or a randomized trial. And of course, it's about novelty. If there, are, so if there are already five randomized trials and then you go back and do an observational studies, it may not be that interesting. No, that's unless a, you find a different angle it's also the context of course yes there's, there's an interesting question as well so editors judge the authors and their work is there a system for editors um, editors accountability for their decisions yeah that's uh, to my knowledge not 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 present unless people are of course starting complaining about decisions but but what do you think uh, 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 michael well there is you know it's, as you say, it's based on complaints or feedback, but there is a, a, a more and more um, um, publishers. So these are the companies or the medical associations that own the journals and publish the journals. They have uh, ombudsmen, so uh, committees that look into, uh, into um, um, uh, integrity or the lack thereof of editors where you could write a letter and say, look, I experienced this. I don't like it. Could you please investigate? And then there is something called COPE, the Committee of Publication Ethics, where, um, where things uh, the editors may have done uh, are um, discussed publicly. Uh, and and the, the, the COPE committee uh, tells you what they think about it. Of course, um, consequences for the editor may not be there, but at least there is a public discussion about the case that you raise. Uh, which is important for 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 the journals. Uh, so so there are some instances that that uh, judge and value the, the the work of editors. Yes, that's that's absolutely true, and I think that's also important to uh, to uh, to use this if if that's needed. If you think that you are not treated in the right way, yeah. So um, another another question comes from uh, from Nicolas Lazar Lazaridis. Is there an interest for studies on the value of multidisciplinary teams in the work regarding patient management or non non cancer patients? In addition, which type of journals might be targets for those type of pay, uh, of papers? Maybe I can ask you this question, Michael. The answer is yes, absolutely. 
That's a very interesting topic. Multidisciplinary teams, so quality improvement, for example, by MDTs for di difficult polyps or for whatever it is, um, uh, is, is of uh, great interest for many journals, I think, uh, with regard to what journal. Well, it depends on what you think your readership is. If it's a very small niche topic, which is only interesting for, uh, you know, the colorectal people of us who do endoscopy, maybe an endoscopy journal. If if you think it's a broader, it's for a broader audience, it involves also pathologists and radiologists and GPs maybe, or nurses, you may think more in terms of a general medical journal. It depends. But yes, there is interest. Yeah, I, I think as well. There's also a question coming from Nijmegen. <laughs> The negative studies may not have uh, that much direct clinical relevance, but can, hold, but can hold value for future research. Do you think journals uh, uh, should have a minimum number of negative study publications to avoid publication bias? Sounds like a good idea. What do you think, Heiko? I, I think, I mean, there's this, I think there are a lot of things not ideal in publication and that is one of the things that are not ideal the other thing is like the, the drive towards impact factor but the other thing is that we have many many more and more journals and many more papers and maybe research that's not really you know it's it's like published for publishing purposes um so but uh, to answer that specific question how would that practically look like okay you know we say okay five percent ten percent should be negative studies but then uh, would be different for an endoscopy journal than for like an annals of an internal medicine journal. So I think the idea in general would be good, but I don't think uh, it's practical. Yeah, true. it's true. And but I, I don't know what you guys think, but negative studies are interesting. And oh, they I, definitely I, are. I, I, we don't reject studies just because they're negative. They are interesting. No, the same is true for us. Uh, we also accept every now and then negative studies because, and especially because they deal with a topic uh, in which there's a certain belief that a, a treatment should be given, but when uh, the paper shows that the treatment is not effective at all. I mean, I, th I think that's that's a negative study, but, but still clinically very important, of course. Um, there's an other comment from an anonymous what do you think about concluding more studies are needed this is always true but should we not avoid this well i i fully agree with this i yes. i hate it as well i mean i know that my researchers are also very often concluding with more studies are needed the more research is needed i don't like it what do you think yeah. michael yeah it's a typical don't it's stupid <laughs> absolutely it's, yeah don't do don't. it yeah. <laughs> true <laughs> Uh, can you please tell us four endoscopy journals with good impact factor that accept original articles without a processing publish, uh, publishing fees? I think that's also an important one. Well, definitely endoscopy is one. Uh, also GIE is one, uh, I would say. Um, but I don't know about the others. Uh, do you have any experience with endoscopy journals and no publication fees? Heiko? I don't. Um, I mean... The thing is, I, I would not, I mean, it depends on, of course, uh, lots of circumstances, but um, you, you want to publish your, your research. If you convince that this is something important, you want to publish it. And it doesn't really matter that much whether you have a high impact factor journal or not. I mean, it, of course, you all want to publish high impact factors, but um, like there's clinical endoscopy, there's surgical endoscopy, uh, there's like some general GI journals, DDS or Scandinavian Journal of Gastroenterology. Oh. So I think those would take endoscopy papers without fee, I, I believe, but some others have a fee. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think I, I just want to a little bit de-emphasize the importance of impact factors when you are trying to select a journal, but it's also when you say, okay, I'm starting at the highest journal and go down and then it's like a year later and your paper is still not published, but you, you want to move on too. And um, it's maybe more important to get it out and have it read than to you know, have it in the high, highest journals. But so, of course, some, some universities have like a certain quality marker based on impact factor and so forth. That's yeah. depends on the local situation. 
Well, there's, it's definitely also true that some universities also have uh, uh, agreements with uh, certain journals on uh, on reduced rate for certain uh, journals. Yeah? So that's also uh, in place. I think because of the time we have, we have time for one uh, uh, last question, and that is, I think, also an interesting one. Are reviewers influenced by the caliber of uh, authors or investigators on a study? Such an, in, such, is, is such an influential doctor in a field um, when the, this person is, is involved, um, will that make a difference when the, the reviewer sees that it is an important doctor that is uh, involved in the study? What do you think, uh, Michael? Is this is this a factor that is that is important? No, it isn't. But I would I would lie if I say it doesn't mean anything, because obviously we see who the authors are, uh, and. Um, we know if, for example, this group has a track record of going doing good research, um, we would probably be more inclined subconsciously to give this manuscript a better grade than if it would be from a group that we have never heard of. I think that happens uh, subconsciously. Uh, it is never uh, something that we consciously put a lot of value on. Um, but I think subconsciously, it, of course, it, it, it plays a role. Yes. I think so too. And I think that uh, as a starter, as a junior author, that, that is sometimes maybe difficult when people don't know your name. But at the same time, it, it, it does not play a, a huge role, but it, it, well, it, there is some kind of effect. I agree as well. Yeah. Having said that, um, I think it's time to conclude. I, I like to thank uh, you, the two of you, for for I think very important uh, uh, presentations that discuss some topics that are important for uh, people that are uh, trying to write a paper or start their own research. Um, and I hope this was helpful for the for for uh, many people. Um, uh, I like to thank also the, of course, the uh, the people that are that participated in this uh, in this uh, uh, webinar, uh, almost 200. So uh, there's definitely something that uh, that people uh, uh, value. Uh, so that's important to know. And finally, I like to thank also uh, ESE for making this uh, this possible. We have a couple of final slides uh, that I like to show. Uh, one is uh, this one where you see that the EZE days are, are coming very close now, April 28 to 30, and there's an uh, early bird registration deadline that ends uh, uh, the 12th of April. So please uh, 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 register. Uh, it will be exciting again, uh, as always, uh, EZE days, uh, uh, full, day, full day of live endoscopy, many sessions, uh, uh, and many people coming from different countries. So I think it's an, an, a unique opportunity uh, to, uh, to speak with people and, and to see and to discuss uh, research. Uh, next slide shows you the, the, the benefits of uh, being part of the ESGE um, a fellowship, a research grants, ESGE days, uh, reduced rates, guidelines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, uh, free registration for, uh, for the Endoscopy Journal. And if you decide to become a, a, a member, um, and especially the ESG dual membership uh, program, then uh, there are benefits. And that means that um, uh, uh, the rate has reduced to 150 euro. So that's, I think, not a lot of money. So uh, please join us uh, and, uh, and be part of the endoscopy family uh, in Europe. I also like to, uh, uh, to guide you to the, to the next, uh, uh, webinar and not next week but in two weeks time this is the EEG journal club paper of the month series and we have two uh, I think very interesting papers being discussed uh, one uh, and presented uh, uh, two papers presented uh, by uh, uh, Wal Walaf uh, Janusvic and also uh, by Daniel von Rentelen uh, and these papers will be discussed by Alana A. Bigbo and Enrique Rodriguez de Santiago so please join us again uh, and um, once again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Good night. Thank you. Good night.